Welcome everybody. I want to invite you to lesson two on our How to Put on the Armor of God series. And I want to especially greet everybody that's watching from around the world. I know we have many uh, uh, people who log into our website from other countries. So I just want to say hello to everybody internationally. And uh, we're so glad that you're here and uh, tuning in to this particular video series. You know, in the overview of how to put on the armor of God, I talked about how I learned to put on the armor of God primarily through the practices of visualization and confession. In other words, I heard someone uh, teach on the armor of God, and he had us go through the motions of uh, girding our waist about with truth, putting on the breastplate of righteousness, uh, the shoes of readiness, taking the shield of faith, putting on the helmet of salvation, taking the very ultra-sharp sword of the Spirit. And so this was a big step up for me. And I believe that when we uh, visualize and confess the Word of God like that, as we're putting on the armor of God, that this is something that God honors as a form of illustrated prayer. In other words, not all prayer has to be totally verbal, but I believe that as we confess the Word of God and we declare, I gird my loins about with truth, I put on the breastplate of righteousness, as we go through the whole list of putting on the armor, I believe that God hears us and honors that prayer. So I'm not in any way diminishing the power of praying in that particular way. All I am saying is I believe there is more for us to pursue in this um, study. So my um, thinking about the armor of God was revolutionized when a gentleman told me we put on each piece of the armor by receiving the revelation of each piece. In other words, we need to receive a revelation about truth, about righteousness, about readiness and faith and salvation and the Word of God and especially using it as a weapon. So uh, this gentleman really helped me and I went home and I read the Ephesians passage over and over and over and over until I began to get the revelation of each piece. And it took me a while because I wasn't sure what I was searching for, but the more I prayed, you know, how many know that uh, if you're not getting anything out of the Bible, uh, that's the time to start praying. And then you read some more. And if you're not still not getting what you think is there, then you keep praying and you keep praying and you keep praying and reading, praying and reading until suddenly Day after day, the, suddenly the light clicks on and you begin to realize something about the subject that you're studying. And what I began to realize was the armor of God is not a series of spiritual objects that's going to be dropped on me from heaven. It is actually the armor of a renewed mind. I have to get my mind renewed in order to put on the armor. So let's talk about this a little bit. See, when Paul used Roman armor, he used it as a metaphor. It's a figure of speech. It's a very appropriate illustration that everybody in the Roman world understood. They all had seen Roman soldiers, and they understood all the different pieces of the armor. And so Paul was saying, wait a minute, there is a spiritual kind of armor and in a way, it is similar to Roman armor, so I'm going to use that as an illustration. But really, the substance of the armor is not some physical object that is applied to your body in the spirit realm. The uh, substance of the armor is something that you believe. So let me explain what I'm talking about. See, in... Psalm 91, verse 4, if we go back to the Old Testament for a second, and this is one of those passages in the Old Testament that actually talks about armor or the armor of God. There are several passages in the Old Testament that we don't have time to go into. I do go into them in my book, The Armor of Light, and I'm basically teaching out of that book. Um, 
I will show you how to get a copy uh, at the end of the uh, today's teaching. But what we're trying to do in Psalm 94, in this Old Testament passage, the Bible says, He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. So they had a big shield, uh, which was called the shield, and they had a smaller shield called the buckler. And it says, His truth shall function in your lives like a shield. Now, that's very important for us to understand. We're used to physical objects protecting us, not the things that we believe. See, that this is a totally different operation. When you get into spiritual things, it doesn't work the way natural things work. And when we're trying to understand spiritual truth, our natural mind messes us up. If you think about it, all you've ever known and all you've ever counted as reality for your entire life is what you can see, what you can hear, what you can touch, what you can taste, and what you can smell. Our five physical senses have determined our idea and concept of reality. But when we come to the Bible and to the spiritual realm, the principles by which spiritual things operate are completely different. Jesus himself said, if I'm talking to you about earthly things and you can't understand it, there's no way that I can begin to talk to you about heavenly things. So Jesus had to put off some of the wisdom that he wanted to share with his disciples and he began to give it to the apostles after he had left and after the Holy Spirit had come, when they were able to begin to understand some of the wisdom that he had to take with him to heaven. Uh, but fortunately for the, the coming of the Holy Spirit, he's been able to transmit that wisdom to us. But we have to understand that spiritual armor does not operate in the same way that physical armor does because we're putting on this armor through an action of our soul, whereas we are renewing our mind and uh, purifying our emotions in order to be able to walk in a protected state. So, if it, here's a statement, believing the truth of God's word, which is light, and we talked about that last week, protects, defends, and armors us against the deception that is in this world. Let me read that again. Believing the truth of God's word, which is light, protects, defends, and armors us against the deception that is in the world. We need something in the armor of God that is going to protect us from the lies and the half-truths and the outright distortion of truth that we find in the worldly system today. And that armor that we find is called the armor of light. So to put on the armor of light that Paul was talking about, going back to my experience just for a second, I realized that I needed more than a visualization of armor. I needed to see something more and understand something more than just visualizing a breastplate being put over my heart. And, and I realize I'm, I'm not saying anything against the teachings um, that go on, but it is so easy to get caught up in talking about Roman armor that we actually miss Paul's point. So if your teaching is primarily focused on the various aspects of the armor and this does this and this does that, there's more to it than that. And so I encourage you to, to listen to what I'm saying today and read the passage and pray about it. So I needed more than a visualization. I needed a revelation of the following seven things. A revelation is a God-given understanding. I just needed the Holy Spirit to enlighten me in these areas. And those areas are truth, Righteousness, readiness, faith, the hope of salvation, using the Word of God as a weapon, and prayer. You see, the armor that protects our souls, meaning our mental realm, our emotional realm, the armor that protects our souls is what we believe. It's what we believe that is 
the, that becomes the armor in our life. If I believe the truth that is written in God's word, I am protected against the wiles of the enemy and all the deception that he wants to throw at us. Uh, Jesus said it like this, when you know the truth, the truth shall make you free. So if the truth can set me free from every bondage, every addiction, every attack, uh, and every assault, then the truth is actually what is armoring me and protecting me and defending me against those things that would try to take me captive. So I just want to tell you, I need the armor of light that comes from the Word of God. Now again, the armor of God is for the soul. The armor of God is not for your spirit. And let me explain to you why. When you were born again of God, you were recreated by God in true righteousness and holiness. Yeah, that's right. I said the word holiness. When you were born again, you were created by God in true righteousness and holiness. But that new creation phenomenon happened within your human spirit. God recreated your human spirit in true righteousness and holiness. And not only that, he sealed your human spirit in that pristine, perfect, beautiful, newly recreated state. You were sealed by the Holy Spirit. In other words, there's no devil in hell that can penetrate your human spirit and steal from you that perfect holiness and that perfect uh, creation that God created you to be. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are his workmanship. That word workmanship in the original language meant his work of art. We are his masterpiece. We have been created in an incredibly amazing way. And when you die and go to heaven, God does not have to cause your spirit human spirit to be born again again because he already did it once. And that perfect, born again, human, sealed by the Holy Spirit, uh, spirit that you have is living within you. Now, the interesting thing is the day after you got born again, your soul had not been changed. Your body had not been changed. If you had a problem in your body, the day after you were saved, in all likelihood, you still had it. You were still dealing with a lot of the same stuff. So in our spirit, we were completely changed and recreated, but in our soul, in our mind, our will, and our emotions, we were still the same person. And you know, the interesting thing is uh, the transformation that has to happen in the soul, in our mental realm, and in our emotional realm, that is something that we are in charge of, and God is not going to do that to us. He's going to help us but he's already done one-third of our salvation for us by recreating our human spirit. By the way, we are spirit, soul, and body, three parts. Most of us, most of us think we're soul and body, but we actually have a human spirit. So as we continue with this, our real question today is how do we put on the belt of truth? In other words, we need to know how to armor ourselves. So the question is, how do we put on the belt of truth? Well, as soon as I say the word truth, that brings up a lot of questions in people's minds. For example, Pilate had a question when Jesus mentioned the word truth. Pilate said, what is truth? People have different concepts of truth. But let me tell you what the Bible says truth is. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth is and the life. Jesus is the truth. He also said in his great high priestly prayer in John 17, he said, Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. God's word is truth. So if we want to know what truth is, and this is the definition of truth that I'm going to use, God's word is truth. When we put on the belt of truth, what we're doing is we are girding our loins about with the Word of God. And does that make sense? What does that mean? 
how do we put on, like wrapping a girdle around our waist, how do we put on the belt of truth? So let me explain it to you like this. When the Roman soldier had to put on his belt, he girded himself about all around his waist with this belt, and he fastened it very tightly so that the belt would not fall off in the heat of battle. Well, how does that apply to us today? Well, I believe it applies like this. We have to wrap the Word of God around the loins of our mind so tightly that we will act on it and obey it even in the heat of conflict. See, putting on the belt of truth means making a quality decision to believe and to act on the Word of God no matter what. See, the Bible, th this is a quality decision where we are going to take the Bible as our authoritative guide uh, for truth and our authoritative guide for how we should live and what our practices should be. For example, um, in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So what is the Word of God good for? Well, it's profitable for doctrine. It's our source of truth. It's profitable for reproof and correction. Sometimes we need to be corrected. Sometimes we're going left and the Bible says go right. We need to be corrected for that. It also gives us instruction in righteousness so that we can know the difference between right and wrong and so that we can make those right decisions. The Word of God is going to make the man of God or the woman of God complete, thoroughly prepared, thoroughly equipped to do every good work. And that's good news. In the Psalms 119.105, the Bible says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a guide to my path. We need to take the Word of God as our guide for life. You know, it's you, you probably know this, but it's one thing to accept Jesus as your Savior, but it's quite another thing to take him as your Lord. One is, oh, Jesus, I want to be saved, so come into my heart, save me, forgive my sins. That's good. When we take him as Lord, we're saying, Jesus, I am your slave. You tell me what to do. He becomes our Lord and Master. So that's a, that's a far different cry than just receiving Jesus as our Savior because, you know, having him as our Savior benefits us. But when we get serious about this thing, we realize we've been bought at a price and we're no longer our own. He has the right, the right of redemption, to tell us what to do and to lead and guide our lives. We'll talk more about that in, a, in one of the other steps about putting on the armor of God about how important it is to surrender to the Lord. It's a big, huge step that each of us need to take. But you, you also know there's a difference between the person that's a hearer of the word and a person that's a doer of the word. See, we don't really have on the belt of truth until we've made that decision that we're going to believe the word and be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. You know, it's like the difference between owning a house and renting a house. When you rent a house, you have the use of the house, but you don't have that same attitude of caring for that house as you do when you actually own the house. There's many people that are renting the Word of God. In other words, they, they use it. Um, it brought them salvation. They uh, have a home in heaven. They believe in Jesus. But it's different when you own the Word of God, when you make it your own, when you make it your guide to life, and you say, Lord, whatever you say in this Word, that is what I am going to do to the best of my ability and with your help. See, there's a difference, there's a shift in the Spirit 
when we suddenly take ownership of the Word of God and realize it is our responsibility not only to hear, but to know it, to do it, and to teach it to others. So the belt of truth is a very vital piece of the armor of God because it's what defends us against all deception. You know, Jesus exposed Satan as a liar and the father of all lies. In fact, it was Satan who in the Garden of Eden deceived Adam and Eve. Uh, God told them, you eat the fruit, you will die. Satan came along and he said, you'll eat the fruit, you won't die. You'll, in fact, you'll be wiser. And Adam and Eve were deceived by that. And it's very interesting. God gave them one word, don't eat the fruit of this tree. But when someone came along and contradicted the word of God, suddenly the belt of truth fell off both of them and they obeyed the voice that contradicted the word of God. So the question is, do you have the belt of truth cinched tightly around your waist? If someone comes up to you, and they, believe me, there are many voices in this world that contradict the truth of the Word of God. So if you hear a contradictory voice, is your belt of truth going to fall off? It's a good question. We're living in a time where there is a lot of deception. Believe me. That which the Bible condemns is made to sound good in our culture today, and those, um, and vice versa. You know, that which is good is made to be made out to be bad, and that which is bad is made out to be good. Our, we have a world that's upside down in their philosophy, but it's the truth of God's word that's going to give us the bearings that we need. See. Learning and accepting God's word as the belt of truth, this is the foundation of all the other pieces of the armor. So, when we put on the belt of truth, this is a, it's a little challenging. It means we have to accept the truth of the word of God, and I love some parts, but there's other parts maybe I don't like. In fact, I used to know where all the parts I didn't like were, and so when I was in my... Um, daily Bible reading, if I was coming up to one of those parts, if I didn't feel like I wanted to be condemned, and, and uh, usually they were the parts that reminded me of my past sins. So sometimes I would just flip the page like, yeah, I know what's there, and I, I, I just can't go there today. But you know, the belt of truth is there for a reason, Even the parts we like and the parts that we don't like. And so we have to... Uh, operate in the truth of God's word because it is our weapon against every single lie. And so this is why it's so important to make an intentional commitment to God's truth as the very first piece of the armor of God. Because either God's word reprograms you from the world's lies or you will continue in worldly ways. And by the way, human beings need a truth that is outside of themselves. I hear people say, well, you have your truth, but I have my truth. Well, <laughs> for truth to guide us reliably, reliably, it has to be an objective outside standard, not a standard that changes with my feelings or with my mood or with my desires at the particular moment. So putting humans in charge of their own truth is kind of like putting the fox in charge of the chicken coop something bad is going to happen because uh, the self-serving desires of the flesh and the desires of the emotions and all of these things, when, when they're put in charge of truth, they're going to just bend truth every which way in order to be able to do what they want to do without having God stand in their way or God's word stand in the way. And that's the big offense uh, of the Word of God today is that we actually have a standard where we know right from wrong and knowing right from wrong is a sin in this world's culture. You should not know right from wrong. Every, what everybody does, oh, it's, it's all acceptable. But no, there is a standard and it is the Word of God. See, here's how this works. All truths are not equal. Okay, you have your truth, I have my truth, but all truths are not equal. And let me explain why they're not. When, 
when you believe something strongly, you're going to act on that belief. So uh, if I have one set of truths, I'm going to take actions based on what I believe. If somebody else has a different set of truths, they're going to take actions on what they believe. Okay, but not all actions produce the same consequences. And this is where the difference is. See, God in his word has given us a set of truths that protect us and defend us from bondage, addictions, heartbreak, bad decisions, and so forth. But in the world, we see people every day who are the victims of their own decisions, which means they were the victim of their truth that they believed. They believed it was okay to do a certain type of thing. Maybe uh, they believed that way in ignorance. But what happened was the consequences of what they did are now different than the consequences are for those who believe and obey the Word of God. For example, let me just give you an example here. One man believes God's truth tells him it's very important to be faithful to his wife. But another man has his own version of truth that it makes adultery okay in his case. So there's two different truths here and two different actions and two different sets of consequences. And believe me, those two families are going to experience completely different outcomes because of the actions produced by different so-called truths. Um, here's another example of why it's important to have an outside truth to guide us. And it's called the compass. You know, if I am in the deep dark woods and I happen to have a compass with me and I don't know where I'm going and I'm lost in the woods, what's great about the compass is it will always point north no matter which way I think is north. In other words, I may think north is to my left and the compass says north is straight ahead. Now, if I follow my inclination of what I think north is, um, history tells us and life experience tells us that people tend to wander in circles when they are lost. But if we have a compass, we can go on a straight line and not just keep uh, covering the same territory that we've covered over and over again. So a compass, because it is an external standard outside of ourselves, it is a reliable guide for us. And likewise, the Word of God functions like a compass in our life. It shows us which way is north, even when our feelings are trying to tell us, well, no, I think I should go left. No, the Word of God tells us you need to go straight ahead and obey the voice of the Lord. See, truth, if, if I'm going to gird my loins about with truth, the truth I'm def that is going to define me can't be what I think. It can't be how I feel, what I want, or what somebody else wants for me, because that is not going to help me in the long run. I, the truth that I gird my waist about with has to be the truth of God's Word, and it doesn't change. So when I put on the belt of truth, I am making a firm decision to let the Bible guide my every step and settle every question. This is a big step, but putting on the armor of God is serious business. It's not just something that we can imagine that we're doing, just visualize it and confess it, even though I believe God will honor that as prayer. But if we're going to deliver ourselves from the spirit of error that is in this world, then we have to have a reliable, unchanging, external standard of truth, and we have that in the Word of God. So, you have a decision to make. If you want to gird your loins about with truth, then you have to choose the Word of God as your system of truth, as the basis of all truth, and at least you will have a standard to go by. When someone asks you, why do you believe that? You can point to the Word of God. 
Whereas if you ask somebody else, where did they get their values? Oh, I just feel it. You know, well, feelings come and feelings go. A person who is guided by feelings is like a person who uses a wind vane on top of a barn as their compass because that wind vane is going to point whichever way the wind is blowing. And so when we live in the world, if we only live by the world's standards of truth and by our own inner feelings where we determine our own truth, then we're going to go this way, then that way, then the other way, whichever way the winds of the culture are blowing. And so it's not going to end up being a good route for us because we are going to go in circles just as the wind blows in circles. When the Apostle Paul was speaking about the end times, he talked about the great deception that the enemy was going to bring into the world. Beginning in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul said that the enemy was going to come against us with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Notice, all unrighteous deception. That sounds pretty ominous. Uh, why are they going to perish? Because they did not receive the love of the truth. And that's my point. We have to receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. One day I was hearing from the Lord, and he was pointing this out to me, that I needed to love the truth. And he asked me if I loved the truth, and I, f I said, yes, I love the truth. And he said, no, you don't. I said, of course I love the truth. The truth is your Bible. I love the word. And he said, you don't love the truth. You have to love the truth. In other words, we have to have a loyalty and allegiance to the truth that's stronger than our own thoughts, stronger than our own feelings, stronger than what everybody else is doing, stronger than our own life itself. We have to have an allegiance to the truth of God's word. That's why Jesus came. That's why he came and died, was to deliver the truth of God to us, not to just keep letting us live according to our own feelings and by whatever um, actions we felt like we could justify in our minds. So God wants to deliver us from the delusion that is going to be in this world. And he warned us about it. And so we have to learn to love the truth. See, you can have a Bible in every room of your house, but if you don't love God's Word more than your own inner thoughts and feelings, you're going to be controlled by your flesh. Your fleshly desires, your emotional desires are going to control your life and lead you to take actions that are not going to have the consequences that you want. See, God wants us to have a better guidance system than that. His word always points in the same direction. His word is true. It always points north. And it's the same word, in fact, that we're going to be judged by. So we have to put on the belt of truth. Many people say, well, I, I have my own truth, you know, and it, you do have your, you have the right, God has given you the free will choice to have your own truth. But you might think that you can fly. And when you take that running leap off of a cliff, I hate to tell you, but that external objective truth of the law of gravity is going to take hold of you. And when you hit the ground, you're going to have very damaging consequences. So we have to learn to put the truth of God's word even ahead of our own thoughts and feelings. Of course, once we put on our belt of truth, we need to be truthful in speech. How can we walk in truth if we don't speak truth? The Bible tells us to speak the truth in love. And when we speak the truth, what are we doing? We're pushing away the father of lies the spirit of lying, and we're delivering ourselves from that tangled mess of deceiving and being deceived. And so speaking the truth and telling the truth is one of the ways that we 
deliver ourselves. But we all have a decision to make. Are we going to let our life be guided by the unchanging, infallible, inspired in, uh, Word of God? And that's a decision. Will you choose today to wrap the Word of God <clears throat> like a belt or a girdle around the loins of your life? So that when you go into the heat of the battle, it is tied on you so tightly that it will not fall off. When somebody contradicts what the Word of God says, your belt of truth will not fall off. You will just stand there and say, it is written. And that's what Jesus wants us to do. It is the first piece of the armor of God. And it is the foundation for all the other pieces. And in the next lesson, we're going to talk about something that's just as important as the belt of truth, and it's how to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Because the breastplate of righteousness will deliver you from one of the most serious attacks of the enemy, which is condemnation. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for my brothers and sisters who are watching today all over the world. Father, your word is truth, and you have given us your word to deliver us from deception. So today, we wrap the truth of the word of God around our lives. And Father, we tighten that belt so securely it will not fall off, even if somebody contradicts what the word of God says. And Father, we just want to thank you for strengthening us today, and we receive the strengthening of your Holy Spirit Holy Spirit, Jesus said you will guide us into all truth. So if we ever have any doubts about what is true and what is false, Holy Spirit, as we listen to your inner witness in our hearts, you will guide us into all truth. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.